4.3 billion people live across this vast continent called Asia, and we are telling their stories. On this edition, on the lookout, vigilantes in Thailand take matters into their own hands to put a stop to human trafficking. And coming to the rescue, a Turkish teen helps Syrian refugee children work through the psychological damage of war. One of them told us that he saw his mother dying in front of his eyes. A bomb came and exploded in, in the right next to her mom. <laughs> yeah, that. I'm Tony Cheng, and this is Assignment Asia. From Syrian refugees traveling across the Mediterranean to try and get into Europe, to those of the Rohingya ethnic minority coming down here on the Andaman Sea in rickety boats trying to move to Southeast Asia, it's clear there is a global dilemma over refugees. Thailand is no exception. Here, the refugees are targeted by human traffickers who abuse and exploit them. But there's a group of vigilantes here who've decided to try and put an end to the human trafficking that's taking place in their own backyard. So we came down here to Panga province to try and meet them and some of those people that are being exploited and in some cases, even killed. These men are vigilantes, volunteers, on the trail of human traffickers. And they're the only thing standing in the way of a people smuggling route worth hundreds of millions of dollars a year. They set out for a grueling few hours march up into the hills overlooking Panga. They know the traffickers use this route to skirt around checkpoints on the road. But they have to be careful. The gangs of people smugglers are armed and dangerous. They travel further up the path. The jungle is thick and the mountain steep. The team are all volunteers, but they feel they have a duty to stop the human traffickers because no one else is. The vigilantes find a ripped dress in the style of a Rohingya Muslim woman. The rips indicate an assault. They think this was evidence of a rape, a fate that befalls many of the women on the human smuggling trail. And they say the traffickers have done much worse. One woman they rescued told them her husband had been murdered in cold blood. เพราะว่าเดินไม่ไหวไงสามีเค้าก็โดนเชือดคอทิ้งที่รู้สึกว่าน่าจะเป็นที่คุระบุรีตอนที่ให้ล่ามมาสัมภาษณ์มาสอบ
Seven months ago, she set out after paying the smugglers to get her to Malaysia. She was four months pregnant, but the smugglers showed her no mercy. Rahena now lives in a detention camp. She was rescued by Thai officials just before she gave birth. Like many others at the detention camp, Rahina paid just over a thousand US dollars to be smuggled into Malaysia. Once in Thailand, however, she was held hostage in a jungle camp while the traffickers tried to extort more money from her family. <laughs> The civilian defense force team in Panga know these camps are out there. They just don't know where. But they're setting out to try and find them. In the narrow creeks and rivers that run into the sea, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. Patrols currently going through these little waterways that crisscross through the mangrove. And you can see how easy it would be for the traffickers to hide thousands of people that they just brought down from Myanmar and Bangladesh. These are vast, unpopulated and inaccessible stretches of coastline. The vigilantes search as best they can but the thick undergrowth makes it virtually impossible to see onto land. There are sites the traffickers have used before where they're likely to return. There's evidence everywhere, abandoned cases and clothes, products from Myanmar, coins from Bangladesh. The patrol advances with caution. They don't know what or who is also on this island. but the traffickers have moved on. Guiding the group is 22-year-old Raihan from Bangladesh. He says the smugglers forcibly took him after luring him to the coast with the promise of a new job. After three weeks at sea, he was brought here, where the smugglers sorted their human cargo into groups. <laughs> His jailers were dividing the captives according to how much ransom they could raise. Those with skills, those with family in Malaysia would be worth more. Others simply sold off as slaves. Rayhan says he was shocked by the inhumanity of the traffickers. But some did, and Rayhan shows me what he says is a grave where one of his group was beaten to death. And the vigilantes have made a similar discovery, not far from the main campsite. But these volunteers have no power to investigate or detain. Why haven't the police or the army been to investigate? Because we, 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 we,
ผมทําเท่าที่หน้าที่เที่ยวเทียทําได้มากกว่าผมไม่ได้ไปเข้าไกลอะไรของเขา The police have set up a checkpoint on the main road going south, but they've done little else. เหมือนพวกผมก็ทํางานลําบากลําบากในขั้นตอนหนึ่งพอถึงชั้นศาลชั้นตํารวจเราทําสํานวนส่งตํารวจตํารวจส่งอายการแล้วส่งศาลจากที่ว่าหลักฐานข้อมูลการสอบสวนอะไรของเราคือถ้ามองจริงๆแล้วมันชัดเจนเป็นมันสมควรที่จะตั้งข้อหาค้ามนุษย์ได้แต่ไปถึงชั้นตํารวจชั้นอายการกลายเป็นแค่ข้อหานําพาหลบหนีเข้าเมืองแค่นั้น And with the human trade now worth hundreds of millions of dollars, the obvious consequence is corruption. ส่วนมากมันก็ผลพวงมาจากเรื่องเงินคนรับชั้นคนระดับใหญ่เขาทำอะไรเงี้ยเราระดับน้อยระดับตัวเล็กแต่เราเรามีความจริงใจที่อยากจะทําเพื่อประเทศเพราะเพราะการที่ทํางานตรงนี้ท่านมณิษท่านนายพื้นเขารู้ว่าทําเพื่ออะไรตรงไหน Even so. In May of this year, the problem became too big to ignore. Mass graves were discovered on both sides of the Thai-Malaysian border that contained hundreds of bodies. Camps where the refugees had been held prisoner in bamboo cages. In Thailand, several high-profile arrests, including one of the generals who had been in charge of stopping the traffickers. Even the grave site we had been shown was unearthed. The body inside was of a woman. She had been four months pregnant. In the light of these discoveries, we went to the Thai police to ask them why they'd allowed these atrocities to happen. If you found all of this information and evidence, mm -hmm. why has it taken so long for these investigations to happen? <laughs> I can say that it's so sad. Why we have to take so long, long time to to run investigation? So that I tell you, we Thailand has also problem. We can say that some police officer, some some governmental official in the southern Thailand, perhaps they can negligence when something something bad happen. Someone said that they can have a benefit or illegal profits from the case, but the way now is don't. I can say that is. It's not a good way to look back why we have to take so long, why we just keep quiet to run investigation from the so, so sad thing happen. I think now is, is, is a good time for us to look forward and then uh, do something really concrete to fix the problem. I think it's better to think like that. It may be better for the police, but looking forward is pretty hard for Mohammed. 11 years old, he was kidnapped by the traffickers last September. Muhammad spent two months at sea and one month in the jungle before the group he was with were caught by the vigilantes. He just wants to go home to his parents, but he can't. The government of Myanmar doesn't recognize the Rohingya's claim to nationality. While we're filming, someone calls for him. It's his mother. Okay, okay. This is the first time he's spoken to her since he was taken from Myanmar. An 11-year-old boy, far from home, without his mum and dad, Mohammed doesn't want to let go. Several months after we met Mohammed, we returned to Panga. He's now taking classes in a local school for migrants from Myanmar. It is some sort of normality, but there remains a gaping hole in his life. His parents are still far away. 
and his chances of seeing them in the next few years are small. The plight of the Rohingya refugees is now global news. But for all the government initiatives and pledges of aid, this little boy is still separated from the people he loves and relies on most. Mohammed has been told that he might get the chance to see his parents again in two or three years' time once he's been resettled in the United States. But he still doesn't know when or even if that's going to happen. Now, still to come on Assignment Asia. Healing their wounds, how a group in Turkey is using art and music to help Syrian refugee children. Welcome back. It's one thing being a refugee and finding a safe place to live. It's another, once you've found that safe place to live, but dealing with the disturbing memories of the past. Sadly, for many Syrian refugees, particularly children, that's often the case, as they have no help dealing with the trauma that they've undergone. Mikhail Badavid met a young man in Turkey who's trying to introduce creative therapy and a bit of fun into the lives of young Syrian children. اجت الطياره صارت تقصفنا درت الانذار تبعت الانذار هي مو منحضر منه هربوا على هي حسن يهربوا على الملجا ومنه ماتوا ما حسنوا يهربوا Twelve year old Saad is one of countless Syrian children affected by war. He may not have been killed or injured, but he is hurt psychologically. He's traumatized. Saad is among the roughly 800,000 children whose families escaped from Syria into neighboring Turkey. Some of them found their way to Istanbul. Sultan Beyli is one of Istanbul's poorest districts. With a population of over 300,000, it is a rural working class area. It has also become home to the largest group of Syrians in Istanbul, with over 9,500 registered refugees. They've managed to flee the war back home, but are facing many other difficulties here in Turkey as they struggle to survive. Saad's father, Ahmed Zerhati, found a job as a Quran teacher at one of the few local Syrian schools. Ahmed says the war deeply affected his son and that the behavioral and psychological effects were clear. From 2011, Turkey had an open-door policy for Syrian refugees. But by 2015, the number of refugees reached one and a half million, making it difficult for government and locals to cope. As the Syrian refugees became more part of our society and our culture, um, the Turkish people's attitudes changed. They're not welcoming the Syrians anymore. One day, 16-year-old Emir Asurash spotted a young Syrian refugee on the streets and decided he wanted to help. So he came up with Project Lift. I define Project Lift as the key to happiness because um, once we're done with the kids, once they get their therapy, once they gain the power to control their fear and overcome um, any obstacle in their life, they'll find true happiness. 
The project is short, it lasts five days, and it combines three types of expressive therapies. Music, dance and movement, and art. 60 children are divided into three classes to explore and express their emotions with the guidance of therapists. The moments that they share their stories with us were the most shocking moments of my life, actually. Because these kids, you know, they've seen some horrible stuff. One of them told us that uh, he saw his mother dying in front of his eyes. A, a bomb came and exploded in, you know, right next to her mom. <laughs> The project has even gotten the backing of the local municipal government. Bu cümle sıkça kullanılır insan odaklı yönetim anlayışı diye. Biz bunu yaşamak istiyoruz, yaşatmak istiyoruz. Bu anlamda Sultan Beyli ilçemizde bu yönümüzü geliştirmeye devam ederken hem Sultan Beyli'deki kardeşlerimize ilgili önemli projeler yapıyoruz hem de böyle bir atmosferde ortada bir dram var, savaş var ve savaşın en fazla mağduru kadınlar ve çocuklar. Ee, özellikle biz diğer anlamda, lojistik anlamda yardımcı olmaya çalışırken bir de o çocukların psikolojileri, o çocukların yaşadıkları travmalar bizim açımızdan da e, dikkate alınması gereken bir konuydu. It feels great doing something good for that kid, you know. When we try to help him, we feel amazing. Because even if we help a single person, we know that it means a lot, you know, to change someone's life, to help him overcome that moment, it means a lot. A mere search for a team of expressive therapists who were willing to volunteer and could tailor a program for refugee children. That's when he found Leila Akça. When they don't have, um, they don't have a way or a place, a safe place to express themselves, they just bottle up and it will become explosive at some point. They, their sense of self will shatter at some, at some point and they, it, it will spill out. They can put themselves in dangerous situations and then it can even lead to suicide. هي كان في علم طالع مظاهرة مهم إيش تطير رصاص وضرب عليهم والبوليس حمنا حسنا يهربوا صار حسنا يهربوا عبيوتهم ومنهم ما حسنا يهربوا قام قتلوا عم بس تسيرت الإسعاف هي إنه إسعاف تركي وأنقذوهم For the children of war, the opportunity to express their feelings in a safe place is crucial for the healing process to begin. So we teach them what emotions are and how to detect those emotions and where they um, feel those emotions in their bodies and also what different sounds mean to them, what emotions they bring up and then different movements. How can we express our feelings through our movements? This is where the children participate in dance therapy sessions. It is a vital part of the program because it integrates body, mind and soul. When a child experiences trauma, the effects can be stored in the cells of the body. So it is vital to mobilize this energy and allow children to express themselves with movement in a safe environment. Rehem arrived in 2013 with her mother and six siblings. The family says her father was taken away by Syrian government officials in 2013. They haven't heard from him since. Rehem's experience with her father is reflected in her art at Project Lift. 
بس اكثر انه انا وابوي وهيك انه ورسمت عين ونفس الوقت انه ارتحت انه هيك انه رسمت شغله انه تعبر على حزني وهيك طلع شيء شيء حزن جامي يعني بحاول اقدر لما كنت بقعدهم انا من نفس من قبل النشاط والنشاط يعني اجى بوقت كثير يعني بوقت بوقت كثير كويس انه انا كنت دريت هيك شيء انا يعني لما لقيت التليفون يمكن لقيت كثير انه استعدت لهالموضوع هذا انا كنت مش يعني انا نفسي انه ريت ابعد عن هالمواضيع هي عدل كثير يعني اوقات انه قاسي عليهم انه ما كويس علي انا حق ابعد عن المواضيع هي ونشاط انا كثير انا حققت لي انه رغبه انه رد انه استفدتوا مثلا الوقت اللي يجوا من نشاط انه قالوا انه استفدتوا ايش فرحتوا ايش عملتوا ايش لعبتوا مشان انا ارسخ لهم نقطه في مخهم هي يعني الموضوع اللي اللي عملوه منيك شيء كتبوه انه ايش صوروكم ايش فرحوكم ايش انبسطتوا مشان هذا الموضوع سبب في مخهم يعني والتفتوا للامور الدراسيه اكثر يعني صار دفتر الرسم اللي جابوا لهم اياهم كذا فتحتوهم تلاقوهم مليانين حتى يعني الغيوم صارت يرسموها لاحظت انه هالموضوع ما كان يعني اشوف يعني ما حتى كنت متيه عنهم يعني بالاحرى حتى الغيوم اللي يرسموهم عليهم وجاه حتى الشمس اللي يرسموها عليهم وجاه مبتسمه حتى النجمه عليها وش يعني مبتسم Amir has also witnessed profound changes in the children. Once we're finished with the project, uh, we see that they change a lot, not in terms of their personality, but in terms of how they uh, show their personality. Because, you know, these, because these kids are in a huge depression, once we help them, they can be more like themselves, you know. They remember that they're only kids. UNICEF estimates some 14 million children have been affected by the conflict in Syria, and there's no end in sight. One thing is for sure, it will take a lot of time and more projects like these before these children can heal. For Assignment Asia, I'm Mikhail Bardavid in Istanbul, Turkey. Project LIFT uses some unconventional models that aren't typically part of creative arts therapy. But if the global psychological community continues to work helping refugee children, it could have an impact on future therapy models. Well, that's all the time we have for today. You can find all of our stories on our website at www.assignment-asia.com. And if you've got any thoughts or ideas for future shows, please contact us via social media. I'm Tony Cheng, thanks for watching, and join us again on Assignment Asia.